Are we live? Yes. Hello, welcome, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the glyphosate debate, which I'm sure if you're a no-till farmer, a lot of people say, ah, but what about glyphosate? And I think I'm right in saying that most people want to find a way of solving this by perhaps finding an alternative way. Um, and this is a, a, an opportunity for us to have a bit of a conversation about how we might do that, how we go forward from here. But the first question I want to ask is to John, and it is how dependent are zero tillage farmers on glyphosate? And is it a deterrent to people who might adopt the system? I'm thinking about organic farmers who might want to go zero till, but don't want to start using glyphosate. I'm just wondering. I've always said that zero tillage farmers can learn from organic farmers, and organic farmers can learn from zero tillage farmers. And the best thing to do would be to get them together. I published uh, three years ago uh, a, a lo lovely machine we had in Brazil that electrocutes weeds. Unfortunately, it has a very small work output, and it was being used to produce um, uh, uh, environmentally uh, safe soybeans for the Swiss market. But you see, the, 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 that pays about 30 or 40 percent more, so you can, you can take that, but it wasn't uh, scalable, you see. I believe there's, a, there's a, a laser weeder now that can do that job. Before, we used to uh, intero cultivate. And also, there is uh, 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 mind-boggling possibility that in Göttingen uh, University in Germany they've discovered a cyanobacterium which uh, emits a herbicide which is similar to glyphosate. So once that gets developed then the organics can come on board with zero tillage which would be marvellous. Very good. We, we will come back to more of that because I want to talk about different methodologies at the end but that's a very succinct does anybody want to add to that? Amir. Um, you know, in many, in many uh, countries in the, in, the, in the developing world, um, uh, glyphosate is not available. And especially with small farmers, uh, um, you could practice very good quality conservation agriculture without glyphosate. Uh, but you have to understand the, 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 the power of different... Uh, practices of conservation agriculture. For, for example, uh, in, um, in Tanzania, uh, we, we did quite a lot of work uh, with FAO uh, where there was no glyphosate provided. Uh, the cover crop, for example, you mix uh, say maize, maize and, and dolichos lablab. Dolichos lablab wipes out all the, all the weeds. Uh, so you don't actually need glyphosate in, in these kinds of situations. There are other other situations within sort of conservation agriculture based push-pull systems. Uh, Desmodium, for example, uh, is a cover crop with maize and, uh, and, uh, and other, other crop. Uh, it would wipe out all the, all the weeds. Now, where you're moving from one crop to another crop, where you want to so-called burn the, burn the existing crop, yes, you, you, you uh, uh, would need glyphosate. Uh, but now, of course, we see that planting green is coming in. Planting green is, is an approach to you would use a roller crimper uh, for, uh, on a cover crop and then move to the next crop without, without applying any, any, any glyphosate. And overall, overall, we need to, to, to um, accept that eventually, eventually we, we think we would be able to, to practice no-till agriculture uh, properly defined uh, with, with very little agrochemical and certainly organic farming, uh, Rodel, Rodel has, has, been, has had a f f five, six years of, of uh, organic conservation agriculture program, and, uh, and they, are, they, are, they seem to be doing quite well. And some of their plots, they claim, are 30 years old, you know. And uh, so, so I, they, in, in theory, they, there's no sort of absolute uh, necessity to use uh, uh, glyphosate. Uh, but then we've got the, the other extreme, where, where, which has been giving 
giving farming a bad name, uh, where, where a lot of glyphosate is used with aerial spraying and, uh, and, and then, of course, um, um, you know, um, other, other glyphosate-based practices, which are really, which shouldn't be there. But in, in theory, I, I think that you could, you could uh, do without glyphosate. And so organic farmers, uh, uh, as John said, can, can learn, fr and we can learn from them as well. Good, and I, I'm just going to ask Frederick now the same question. Oh, that's not going to be the French point of view. It's going to be Frederick's point of view. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we, first of all, have to bear in mind that if we are all here today and interested about conservation agriculture is because uh, we had some glyphosate on the road that really helped us at the beginning. And if we didn't have this uh, help, I mean, uh, conservation agriculture in our countries and worldwide will not be where it is today. So that, we have to be clear about that. Second kind of things, um, we really move forward in, uh, at least in, in France and on my farm on 25 years, as having a technique very dependent on glyphosate. I mean, every time I was sitting, I was uh, drilling, I was using glyphosate, and sometime during two crops, I was using glyphosate. And thanks to cover crops, thanks to modifying the rotation, thanks also to the public pressure, because um, they could be useful to some extent, uh, we, we move to use less and less glyphosate. Thanks also to uh, spraying techniques as well, by uh, getting um, I mean the, the water more acidic and, uh, and spraying during the night and uh, with a higher agrometry, we reduce quite a lot the usage of glyphosate. And so now, I mean, basically, we on my best rotation uh, would be out of glyphosate three years out of four, uh, which mm, for staying direct drilling, um, well, as farming is never all the time working the way you like it to be, I would say on average is two years, honestly, out of two. Okay, out of four, I can drill two times without glyphosate like for that and still by being a direct driller. Uh, and to, to complete, um, I would say a banning like for that today, uh, I think would be a, uh, an obvious a big mistakes because we have worked a, lo a long way forward to reducing. Uh, we'll probably be someday be able with new products or with new techniques to reduce even more, or even to, to stop using life for that. But the best researcher on the world to do that are farmers. They are not uh, people from above. They are farmers. And uh, any one of us are already working on that. And um, I, I, I think, and I always work on that. It's just like we say in France, the antibiotics. It shouldn't be automatic, but uh, not having the antibiotic, it will be a big mistake. Thank you very much. Um, I think the answer in the structure of this session is going to be a bit like question time. I want to ask the audience to ask questions at the end of each question. So is there anybody who wants to ask a question on that from the audience now? The question being, is there... It, do, do you think it's a deterrent to, um, to farming with glyphosate, to, to no-till farming? Do you think it's a deterrent to the people wanting to join that practice, to join that way of farming, because we're using glyphosate? And those answers, I think, are showing that what we're wanting to talk about is how to do it without glyphosate, moving beyond glyphosate one time. I was going to ask Will the same question while you're thinking of an uh, audience questions. Um, I just want to say something about glyphosate and um, our habits of wanting to demonize something and it's, it gets quite irrational the whole um, glyphosate debate as well. Um, we wouldn't be no-tilling now if it wasn't for glyphosate as Frederick says um, and that's entirely correct. Neither should we be ashamed of using glyphosate. I think our attitude is we need to be aware of its risks, even though uh, the science isn't necessarily saying it's particularly dangerous. All chemicals will have trade-offs, etc. 
Um, so I, whilst we should be enlightened about think, looking at alternatives, I don't think we should throw the baby out of the bathwater uh, about glyphosate. We shouldn't single uh, glyphosate out, um, particularly for particularly special attention. Its main drawback is it's used so much, it's so successful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can I just come in? Yeah, yeah. yeah quickly, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I think we also need to keep in mind that uh, well, several years ago we, we tried to calculate who actually is using uh, glyphosate. We came, came to the conclusion that some 93, 94% of the glyphosate is being used by conventional agriculture. It's not, sort of, it's not the no-till or conservation agriculture farmers uh, who, are, who are using. And, and when we looked at the rates of application, we found that where there was good conservation agriculture being practiced, the rates were half of what were being applied by conventional farmers who were also plowing and, and, and basically you know, damaging the, the, the soil as well. So, so uh, I think we, we need to keep that in mind as well. And, and secondly, uh, ECAF, the European Conservation Agriculture Federation, has done quite a lot of research on safe use of, uh, of glyphosate. For example, in conservation agriculture system, uh, because there's hardly any erosion, you know, glyphosate and lower, lower amounts of glyphosate are being used. The, the glyphosate doesn't actually move with water, you know, and it doesn't certainly get into the water system. It stays where, where it's apl applied. Um, so. That's all very useful. Any questions on that question that I can see? Hand up? No. Yes. Oh. A comment more than a question. Aspirin has been a very good product for the last 50 years or whenever it was developed. But aspirin, you used incorrectly, can be quite dangerous. And that is the real problem with glyphosate, the inappropriate use of it, and the, how, media, how the media can use it to sell papers and rather have a, we're in danger of having a black and white situation as regards glyphosate, that the wrong people are using it. You go into the horticultural and garden centers and there's very many products there that are basically glyphosate based. And if they are inappropriately used, it gives it a bad name. And that's what a real problem is, the danger of misuse of glyphosate and uh, the, the idea that people will get that it is just a bad product. Glyphosate is a very useful product in the right hands, and that's what everyone should bear in mind. Over to John to, to comment further on that. I think um, the World Health Organization about three years ago came out with a statement saying that glyphosate was possibly cancerigenous. How can uh, a responsible organization without scientific proof put that out to the world? That is what put the cat amongst the pigeons and spoiled the... Uh, it, it, contributed a lot to the um, uh, to glyphosate becoming a whipping pot boy also the uh, councils using them to, to for the weed killing on streets and things on roadsides i suppose verges and spraying must have made a difference don't didn't councils used to spray glyphosate on the streets to to keep the weeds off the pavements. Local authorities use glyphosate in public parks, on roads. The Ministry of Transport keeps the railway line clear of vegetation through glyphosate. And glyphosate, by law, is permitted to be sprayed around water bodies, which is quite 
you know, uh, odd. But so, so it can also get into the water, water system. Uh, uh, so we, we are using glyphosate. Uh, the, the, the issue, I think, uh, what, uh, if I may, what John Landers has just pointed out, I, th I think what, uh, what the IARC, which is the WHO organization, uses, John, it goes beyond just the toxicological assessment of glyphosate. It also takes into account the exposure. And I'm afraid at the moment, what we, what we are facing is, is that the exposure of glyphosate to a human being has gone very high. And, and, uh, and, uh, um, and that, that scares me, it should scare everybody. And it's in the food chain. 65% uh, of Americans have glyphosate in their blood. In, in, in Europe, uh, UK and Germany, I think, top the list uh, of glyphosate in our blood because, because we, we spray glyphosate uh, as a desiccant. So, uh, and that is taken into account by IARC, uh, which, as I said, is, is the monitoring body of the World Health Organization. And, and it should, quite rightly should, because if we continue to going to be increasingly exposed to, to any chemical, I mean, even if you, you know, then, then I think we are going to uh, have, have the negative consequences coming upon us. So, so uh, um, and the, on the other, other hand, European Union assessment is mainly based on the, on the hazard of the, of, the, of the substance itself rather than exposure. And so there are two systems. Uh, and WHO doesn't have to follow the European Union uh, uh, pro process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that leads me on to the second question, which is if glyphosate is used in the pre- or peri-establishment phase and then not used on the growing crop, is there evidence to show that it is harmful? So in other words, Going to what this gentleman who was from the audience who commented on the fact that this isn't black or white, that there are shades of grey, is there scientific data or, or any evidence to show whether or not it has varying degrees or whether there's something in the soil that can absorb it if it's used once only before st starting to plant your, your seed? That's what I wondered. Who would like to answer that? Frederick. Um, we... When uh, this whole glyphosate story start to come up, um, some other farmers of our network start to uh, make uh, some glyphosate analysis of our, this, the grain or in our beans, and uh, haven't seen a, a no-tiller coming to me and saying that he, he had glyphosate residue in his grain. I mean, it costs 150 euros to get your uh, uh, analysis. There is already some. Uh, uh, grain networks in France for like spring barley for uh, for bee making you know some people are doing uh, analysis also and uh, saying they don't find they don't find glyphosate in a, in, no in the grain so uh, well it comes also to a, a second uh, a question or worry about uh, uh, in Europe, uh, that means that we import uh, a lot of grain that are, well, people use glyphosate for desiccation and so So the, I think the risk will be higher. And also, uh, glyphosate is uh, so widely used, I'm pretty much sure there is glyphosate uh, uh, surrounding us in the air. And uh, like all other things that is widely used in, in the planet, and uh, we probably are breathing some... Uh, uh, micro molecules of glyphosate. It's probably why we got glyphosate in 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 our bloods. And um, the thing is, just to and and we have to work together to uh, not overuse and just to use where it is very strategic and uh, if to keep it for very strategic things like no-till, like uh, couch management and uh, things like that. But uh, it was so cheap and so easy to use that uh, it got overused. Anybody else want to talk on that? On the application of it at that early stage. Is there anybody from the audience who wants to add anything on that particular topic, on it being used in, in, a, in the pre or peri stage of crop establishment rather than being sprayed on standing crop for death. 
um, just to talk about the, um, <clears throat> I think um, because there is a natural discomfort with people, the idea of um, spraying gly glyphosate on a grain crop when the heads of the grain are more exposed. Um, and, you know, there may be um, an argument uh, in Europe, particularly if we wanted to sort of try and retain glyphosate to uh, make a commitment to not using it in crop um, after a certain growth stage and that sort of thing. And that might well be a potential um, way of ameliorating some of the concerns about it, even if there is no real scientific um, evidence to show that it actually is harmful um, uh, in grain or in the late stages of a crop. But it is something that um, may be worth proposing rather than seeing a ban. But I don't know if that's possible. No, it's an interesting thought. Um, anybody else to say anything? Or do we move on to the next one, which is, um, I've put here, all chemicals applied to kill something must be toxic. Why is glyphosate, glyphosate particularly targeted? What about other endocrine disruptors? That was my question. And who, who wanted to answer that? Amir? My own um, feeling is that glyphosate is now used at a level where I mean, you, you, you've read reports. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's in the air. It's in the water. It's in the food. It's in the livestock feed. And it is in our blood. I mean, you know, it's, 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 uh, this is uncomparable compared to other, other, other uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, that it, we've not reached that level with any other chemical, um, uh, except perhaps with DDT, we were approaching it. But, uh, but that's the situation. And secondly, secondly uh, I think that there, there, there have been uh, uh, situations where we are, we are getting glyphosate also mixed up with GMOs. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, especially uh, uh, the, the Roundup Ready GMOs, where, which which actually is, which go together, and and of course that uh, uh, has not helped at all. And then of course you, I don't know if you saw uh, the Bonn meeting of COP, uh, the climate change meeting in Bonn, um, the environmentalist uh, focused on glyphosate. Because the way it was applied, the way it was abused, and the way villages and people were, were drenched with glyphosate from air, you know, and that doesn't help anybody. Uh, uh, and so when, when we see that uh, happening with glyphosate, it, it, you know, it's very difficult then to, to remove that image. And, and, uh, and, and lots of cases now have appeared where, uh, where uh, you know, children have gone ill and, and uh, so... But anyway, I, I think that, that that is certainly playing a big, uh, big role in, in uh, and of course the livestock feed we import here. We don't even bother to measure whether there is any, any glyphosate in the, in, the, in the livestock feed. It comes from outside where, uh, you know, um, and so it's in the milk as well. It's in, 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 uh, in so, uh, so I think that we, we need to be aware of it, that it is now everywhere and unfortunately, the authorities don't seem to be to be that bothered about it, and so so uh, it, the whole argument is now very mixed. Uh, but it, but I, I think that there is sufficient case to be worried about about the way it is moving in in, in, the, in the food chain, in the air, in the water. Thanks very much, um, John. Um, I had understood that the big nasty in Roundup is the um, surfactant. It's in very small quantities, but apparently it's, it's very dangerous. Now, we should talk about banning the surfactant if that's causing a lot of the trouble, and not the glyphosate itself. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the, the industry would find another surfactant that was less toxic. 
so yes, okay, over to Frederick. Okay. Um, I got two answers, two, two points. The first point, um, I completely agree with what I said, but when, on the other hand, when you look at how many, uh, the amount of glyphosate that is used on the world and it, uh, badly used, and uh, the risk of contamination of uh, many people around the world and so little contamination and problems that it brings, I mean, that make me think that it could be safe if we use it a proper way. Um, and uh, the, the uh, okay, I leave you. Okay, <laughs> answer for the next question. There is a question from the audience there. Can you take a microphone, just sitting here? Gentleman with the blue shirt. It's uh, really uh, a, a couple of comments. One is uh, glyphosate is not an endocrine disruptor, and we should not confuse the two active ingredients or types of chemical. Glyphosate also That's is not, <laughs> not used at peri-emergence, otherwise you're going to do severe damage to your crop. Uh, it's not labelled for use at peri-emergence, it's used pre-emergence or pre-drilling. The comment I like to make is really because I'm old enough to remember the problems this country had with cooch grass and other perennials, that we're going to be very uh, careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because I remember sitting on a tractor for endless hours trying to kill perennial weeds. There is also a, uh, so there's a lot of the audience don't remember what cooch grass is and the damage that it used to do to yields and the damage we used to do to our soils to eradicate this very uh, damaging weed. So we need to be very careful about that. Also, we've very been a bit selective, I think, with our scientific data. One of the reasons why glyphosate has got such a benign scientific profile is that we can actually find it in our bodies. I, I'm quite happy for that because it means the glyphosate hasn't reacted in my body. If it had and we found the breakdown products, then we know that it would have reacted in our body and done some damage. So the fact is, it goes in one hole and comes out various other ones in an unchanged state, oh, like which that. means that it doesn't do the damage. Now, I'm not saying it's right to have it in our blood, etc., etc., and if it's used in an uh, irresponsible way, I'm totally against that. But we need to get our facts right, I think. Well, thank you. I, I do think that there is significant evidence. <coughs> is there not cancer evidence? Is there not significant evidence coming through to suggest a link between glyphosate and cancer? Um, well, actually, it's an interesting one. And when you look at all that data, and, you know, if we're going to be scientific about things, then that is what we must do. And we start looking at the data um, with glyphosate and cancer. And... Uh, it appears that there's nothing particularly strong. I mean, w so first of all, w why is it cancer that uh, glyphosate may affect? I mean, n not a host of other diseases. So, it's if you if you get on the internet, you can see you know anti Monsanto stuff about cancer. But it's you've got to look at the the data rationally. And the only thing um, that glyphosate potentially had an impact on was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and even that wasn't statistically significant. Um, and of course, the court cases in the USA are based on a, on a, a jury of lay people's opinion about whether that glyphosate, the glyphosate use could have caused non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it wasn't saying glyphosate will give you cancer, um, or it wasn't saying glyphosate can give you cancer. What it was saying, the fact that somebody uh, contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the fact that they used glyphosate may have had an impact, but it may not. And that's all we are. And beyond that, the scientific data is not strong, and we must always try to articulate that. I understand people's apprehensions about any chemicals, because we've grown up in an era where we're encouraged to think that, you know, chemicals, ergo, are bad. But we must be rational about it, we must be scientific about it, and we must remember the trade-offs as well. What's less bad? Uh, nothing's perfect. I mean, I can go and have three pints in the earthworm arms tonight and be fine. If I go and have 33, I need my stomach pumped and I'll be in a heck of a mess. But 
you know, one is a lot more toxic than the other. And so we must remember to be pragmatic about things. Okay, thanks very much. Did you want it, John? Um, at looking at the literature, I find very few uh, uh, references which distinguish between Roundup and glyphosate. So what are we talking about? If it's the surfactant in glyphosate which is causing cancer or whatever it is, it should be separated out. But there is a whole lot of fuzz, even in the technical literature, where they do not dis distinguish sufficiently between glyphosate and Roundup that has a surfactant in it. Well, uh, I think we, are, we have to move a little bit away from this debate because this is uh, really taking us down. And uh, we have to accept that when we make agriculture, we have an impact on the environment, whatever kind of agriculture we do. The first man that start farming, they use matches, or not matches, they use fire, and they burn. So what is the impact of fire on the environment? There are still many farmers around the world using the fire, okay, to clear the, the, the bush, and to so that has a heavy impact. Then farmers decide, because there was nothing else to burn, decide to till, to get rid of the weeds. So we know all the impact of tillage so far. So now we find using herbicide, glyphosate. I'm going to make a little brackets. Now you can buy glyphosate, a, a Roundup in France, in supermarket, without glyphosate in it. It's uh, acetic acid. And, and Super U sa sell acetic acid at 12 euros the half liter and the name, brand name is Roundup, so they're making a pretty good deal. And a vinegar for 12 euros, half a liter, <laughs> it's not. I tried it because I thought it was a magic bullet, so I tried it. Um, it burned a bit, the leaves, but then it regrows quite well. So it was my bracket. So we have to accept that killing the plants to establish a new crop is not an easy thing, and it's still killing. Whether you roll it, whether you plow it, whether you spray it, whether you burn it, and you will still have an impact on it. I will take another simple example. While we like to grow cover crop, we like to roll the cover crop. It's working well. Okay, it seems to be a soft way to kill the cover crop. But think if you are a partridge in the field of cover crop, or a hare in the field of cover crop. Well, you will, you will roll them down as well, okay? So it's, there is no farming activity with no impact. So then we have to take a broader view and bring things about the carbon, things about the energy, things about the soil, things about, I mean, the biology in the soil, but stop letting everybody looking at little bits. We have to make everybody think at the world of you. And what I heard this morning with Alan Savory, he concluded his... Uh, uh, in speech by saying we have to go for fact and science. Don't let the emotion, you know, make the decision. Fact and science. Very good. I mean, that, uh, that, is a very, that is very interesting points about, um, and also about the kind of hype that goes with all these things, because I have a feeling that um, everyone's heard of glyphosate suddenly. You could, if you go anywhere and you say something about glyphosate, somebody says, oh, I know about that, that's bad, that cool. And this happens through a kind of media hype that unintentionally very often, but it, a certain way of reporting snowballs. And I do think that, um, that, that, that it's odd that one, one substance has got this much attention over every other one. Does anybody in the audience want to comment on this? Hand up there. I may as well give you mine. Thank you. Uh, Tom Allen Stevens, Crop Production Magazine. Um, it's a sort of slightly um, related, if you like. Um, the, we, we've, uh, as far as scientific evidence is concerned, we do have a lot of scientific evidence to show uh, resistance, weed resistance to um, glyphosate. And just recently, there was a, pub a paper published by Rothamsted, peer reviewed paper, um, showing that there is now uh, reduced tolerance in black grass 
to glyphosate uh, in this country. Um, so my question to the panel is, are we actually in danger through our uh, misuse or overuse of glyphosate, um, uh, getting rid of the substance or getting, making it obsolete through our own, our own use rather than um, it being regulated against us? Thank you. That's a bit like antibiotics or something else. Who would like to answer that? Will. Um, yes, we are. I mean, we, we know from experience in Australia um, where generally, uh, from my experience when I went out there, they would like to have a very clean stubble in their fallow period, so they'd be spraying three or four times to keep it clean. I think the most important thing, and it sort of harks back to what I was saying earlier about wanting to try and retain this useful, relatively benign chemical uh, and extremely effective, um, would be when we're doing uh, no tillage, is to remember to try and uh, do everything with quality. So that sort of thing would be, you know, quality of stewardship of all of our chemicals. So overuse would be, you know, more than once in 12 months, but if you could um, you know, manage your stewardship of your chemicals, then you've got more chance of them retaining um, their effectiveness. So all these sorts of things, from the, especially from the no-till perspective, come into play. And I think um, that definitely, if we're not careful, we will um, make it redundant anyway. Um, yeah. Which actually leads on to my fourth question, which is um, what other methods could be used in a, in a situation where there was a ban or that it ceased to be effective um, to, um, to carry on the zero-till system, obviating the need for glyphosate? glyphosate. Um, who wants to? Well, we started to talk a bit about um, other, other things you can do to avoid need to use it earlier. Does anybody want to go develop those different methodologies as an alternative that could be, or the all the way the future could be done? I don't know, robotics, something like that. Talking, yeah, John. There is another herbicide to substitute glyphosate, and it's called ammonium glufosinate. Uh, it's considerably, it has a considerably uh, higher toxicity rate than glyphosate. Uh, is more expensive. Uh, if we ban uh, glyphosate, we'd have to use that. And who would pay the difference? Uh, is the uh, environmentally sensitive public prepared to pay a higher price for their food? If they are, we can do it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm will answer a little bit, yes, there is risk and we've got to lower the use anyway. And, um, and, and we have to keep working on a uh, way we do no till that need less uh, glyphosate. And uh, what we have found is uh, if we direct drill a uh, crop uh, straight after harvesting the first crop, most of the time your stubble is clean and if it's a dry time and you uh, manage correctly the moisture and can have a good start of your next crop, usually you're safe without using glyphosate. We see also uh, some really cropping going on in some part of uh, the Canada and United States, which means that you got the first crop growing or the cover crop growing and you pre-plant the next crop in between of the first crop, which means you harvest the first cover crop or crop, and then you get the succeeding crops going. So there is high Ds coming up, uh, which are, I think, ways to uh, limit the use of glyphosate when we have uh, succession of plants. And I'm sure we will find more solution in the future. But how it was said earlier on, um, well, it is a powerful weapon, and it will stay powerful if we we'll use a little, as little as possible. But still, I mean, we will still have time where the weather is not with you, the field is not with you, and, and, and you will need to clean your field before you plant or after your harvest. And, and we still need something to do. And if we have to go back to tillage, 
it will not be a benefit for all. So whether we stick with a bit of glyphosate or we use something else, I even have some farmers in France thinking about going back to a uh, sulfuric acid that it was used in the future. And it, it is not a synthetic chemical because uh, most of the worries because it's synthetic chemical. It is just a simple uh, things, but it is quite dangerous anyway to, to use and for the soil. Uh, Will? Um, the Alan Savory fan in me would um, say I could probably reduce glyphosate by 50% overnight if I wanted to, and I just have to introduce more livestock on my farm. So all of a sudden, my dependence on um, glyphosate could be a lot less if I had three years of, of uh, grass complementing my cropping or something. So, you know, there are, there are always... Uh, ways around it. What I find in Western Europe, um, particularly that m makes our situation not unique but potentially problematic, a lot of our crops are in the ground for 11 or 12 months of the year and that makes sometimes some cover cropping quite difficult. Uh, knife rolling which um, could be more successful in South America or uh, tropical areas or areas where uh, there's more growth uh, for more of the year uh, is pretty difficult to get effective and with the right timing of um, of the covers to to be rolled to provide enough mulch so it's very location dependent um, so I think I think we're going to if we're looking for that opportunity to sort of start afresh each time for our crop in our monocultures. Um, at the moment, I think we're looking for technological answers and necessity is a mother of invention. Uh, so who knows in, in 10 years time, we might, might see um, other methods evolve um, to replace or complement uh, glyphosate. I feel that we're really at a very early stage of uh, uh, development, uh, and um, I, you know, in the in the UK, very little research is being done on weed management under conservation agriculture. In fact, there's hardly any work being done. Most of the things which we are we have discovered are basically through farmer innovation, and I, I think that we I think we should. Um, mobilize universities and, and research institutes to start looking into this in a serious way. Uh, I mentioned Rodell. Now, Rodell claims that they have been able to, to, to move into conservation agriculture or no-till system without the use of glyphosate, you know. I think, I, I, and, uh, um, and there are techniques coming through, like planting green, and also on smaller scales, certainly one, one can bring in all the, all the dimensions of conservation agriculture to, to, to control weeds. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful that moving forward, over the next 10, 20 years, we will, uh, we will be able to discover more and more practices and the way, combination of practices which really uh, allow us to bring down uh, the, 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 the glyphosate use and, and also use of other, uh, other agrochemicals as well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that, that's my four questions. Are there any questions from the audience about any other aspect? Yes, there. Back to my act. Oh, this here, the person over here on the right. Yes. The other chap is next to you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Ollie Harris, sort of cereal farmer from Merseyside. I think we need to take a bit of a step back here with this whole glyphosate thing. We want, first, we need to stop mentioning it in the same sense as cancer because there's no direct link and we know that. The other thing is, is if we take look back 40 odd years since it was invented, just think where our soils would be now. Would there actually be any left? If glyphosate was invented today, it would be national news because it'd be celebrated because we've come up with this miracle thing that can save all our soils because that is what we need to, to grow our food, to feed the nation, to feed the world. And, you know, we, we need to celebrate it. We don't need to start demonizing it anymore. It, the whole thing's just needs turning on its head. It's ridiculous. Sorry, I think, I think I've just jumped in front of Steve. When I first 
did zero tillage in 1976, I used Gramoxone. We've come a long way since then. <laughs> There's a qu question just down here. Sorry, I'm just going to give this one to this one. Um, hello, Jenny Phelps, Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. I think the biggest issue that I had with glyphosate was the fact that it was um, deemed to be safe. I remember people saying you could drink it, and I know that my son uses a lot of it on the farm that he is, that he works on. I've seen people let their six-year-old children use it, you know, to, to weed their gardens. And I think the biggest lesson we should learn is to not say that something is safe if subsequently, decades down the road, that we see that it may not be safe, it may not be very harmful, it may be quite benign, as you suggested. But I think the reason for its overuse was this idea that it is completely safe. And I know that my son will use his protection uh, gear for all the other chemicals that we know that are much worse, but actually quite often people are quite relaxed, I think, about glyphosate because they think it isn't harmful. I think the problem with that is that you end up with people fearing that they don't want it to have been cancerous because there's so many people that have used it frequently, whether that's farmers or people within you know, the local authorities or children or people in their gardens. But I think the message possibly we ought to, I ought to ask maybe is that you know, how do we prevent this happening? If we can evolve chemicals that will help us on this journey to regenerative agriculture, can we make sure that we can't declare them as safe when we find 10 years down the line that they may not be? Good question, uh, well, good point, in, in fact. Does anyone, want, yeah, Will. Um, I totally hear what you're saying. However, you know, when we talk about the safety of anything, um, there are risks and hazards in all, in all that we do. And we've got to remember with a lot of the chemicals, um, the toxicity is dependent on the dose. And agrochemicals are, pretty well highly trialed. I, I mean, I wouldn't stand here and say you know, glyphosate is not carcinogenic or it, it, because we don't know what's going to come. I, I totally concede that. But I think we also ought to um, respect the, the scientific processes um, that say, to all intents and purposes, at the moment, for, with, the, with the scientific evidence we know, looking at things rationally, that it appears to be safe. <laughs> okay. Anyone else talk? And another question at the back there. Just really a comment for someone who's actually drank Roundup. Um, so that was a long time ago, and it doesn't seem to have affected me too much. Um, it was just really to add to the Rodale comment. Uh, the organic movement are very good at saying this with no tilling in Rodale. We've been doing it for 30 years, and the yields are the same. But what they forget to say is that every five to 10 years, they have to have a summer fallow, i.e. no production, to control perennial weeds. And they then rely on tillage to control those perennial weeds and the subsequent damage that that would done to the whole five, 10 years of soil building they may have done under that system. I'm with Ollie. We need to talk this product up because if it was invented today, it would be a world beater. It's going to facilitate, for the first time in man's history, food security and the rebuilding of our soils. No other system facilitates that. So just be careful what we talk down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just right down here at the front. Near, I, I won't give you my mic. I'll wait for this. Which, so wait, where, sorry? Just here, front, front row here, second row here, oh. on the corner. If you put your hand up. Thank you. Hi. Um, you all seem to um, agree that excessive use of Roundup is, uh, of glyphosate is, can be dangerous, um, and you all claim to be using it responsibly. So I just wonder who is to judge who is using it responsibly and who isn't? The question was, um, who, who is going to judge what safe levels are, given that excessive use of glyphosate now appears not to be good for us or safe or queried? Yes? Well, um, for, sorry. Uh, first of all, I, 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 don't, I don't think anybody is trying to talk down glyphosate. You know, I think we're having a discussion here. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that it is in the interest of everybody 
to try and find a way forward as to how to make agriculture less and less dependent on expensive agrochemicals and, and including, including, including um, uh, pesticides. I think, I think that's, that objective should always remain uh, uh, you know, an, uh, of concern to everybody. Um, interesting, this is a very interesting question. I mean, I, I, uh, glyphosate being a, 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 what do you call it, an endocrine dis, uh, disruptor, uh, uh, glyphosate being an uh, endocrine disruptor, disruptor uh, of course, uh, different countries have different sort of levels, you know. Uh, and uh, in the UK, it, it's, it's measured at, um, at uh, a very, I mean, the low, I think it's 50, 50 um, uh, uh, not parts per million, but what do you call it? Um, um, sorry? Uh, my, well, it, it, it's, it's something, it's another thousand below. Whereas Australia has a higher, higher level, and U USA has even a higher level. So there is no, no consensus here. Uh, and the question you're posing is a very important one. Uh, who should decide? Uh, and it, it's just, you know, different uh, authorities are different deciding uh, and putting in their own uh, sort of uh, levels based on what evidence they have. There, there is, um, there is, sorry, did you want to come in? Yeah. Sorry? Hi, thanks for listening to me. Um, the people, the ultimate arbiters of what responsible use is, it's the Chemical Regulatory Directorate who issue the, issue the MAPP number on any glyphosate containing product. That is the definitive arbiter of what is safe. The regulators take great account of environmental fate, environmental toxicology, end use, end user safety, and when they do this, they make sure that the rates, the dose, the frequency of use are all taken into account and it goes on the product label. The product label dictates exactly how often at what rate it can get used. There you go, wrapped up in one neat package. So at, at, the, at the moment, at the moment, the, 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 the operational levels are different as far as I, I, can, I can read. And, uh, and uh, and the, I think we're in a situation where we've got to sort this out because, for example, the uh, one group of people, the regulative bodies, tend to use evidence from the, 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 the chemical companies, whereas the World Health Organization doesn't t take that into account because, because that sort of, that they don't regard it as independent evidence. Um, when, when the World Health Organization uh, uh, put glyphosate in the 2A category, uh, they, oh sorry, uh, um, they, they, they considered that there was sufficient evidence that glyphosate had a negative effect on animals, but still not sufficient evidence for humans, but there was evidence, like for example, non-Hodgkin disease coming, uh, coming in. Uh, so. But the levels, I, I, I think that they are, they are different levels at the moment in, in different, different countries, uh, and there is no consensus. And I think there should be uh, uh, you know, an arrangement whereby they look, look at this, uh, what are the levels. But I, I don't think there's enough e evidence available to, to, to set those kinds of levels. Uh. John, you wanted to say something. As I understood the question, it was who uh, regulates or who inspects the way that the glyphosate is used. And so th this, uh, there may be regulations, but people uh, might not follow them when they use it. Uh, did I interpret the question right? Uh, I was think it was actually about setting a level. A gr who is going to actually be responsible for deciding what, what level was set. But um, I, I think I'm gonna, is there any, anybody else wanting to ask a different question? Okay. If you can get the mic round, round then, that person there. Um, I'd be interested to know what the speaker's opinions are on 
the effect of mycorrhizal fungi from the application of glyphosate and what's that versus the effect of no tillage? The, the use of, the, sorry, can you just explain the, the, on the effect of using glyphosate on mycorrhizal fungi? Yeah, my understanding is that it has a negative effect <coughs> on um, mycorrhizal fungi. There's a number of studies that cite this. Um, but I'd be interested to know what the speaker's views are on that and if there's a difference between the effect of glyphosate, if it's more, if it's worse to use glyphosate versus no tilling on the effect of mycorrhizae, because obviously mycorrhizae are essential for soil building. Well, um, it's always very hard to uh, evaluate uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, agrochemicals uh, like uh, on on soil life, uh, it's difficult for different result, reasons. The first reason is uh, many of the studies are made in lab, and uh, most as most of the studies are made in lab, usually it's soil they take from the field and they disturb the soil, and it's not the soil that you find in the field, and especially the soil that you find in no-till. Um, then if we come to, uh, that was the same thing about earthworm and uh, mycorrhizae and everything. And mycorrhizae don't like to be disturbed as well by any kind of tillage. It is the biggest disturber of mycorrhizae, that's tillage. Second thing is we have a different research about mycorrhizae in France and we have a big research at the moment with the BAS group. And, um, we are doing research with ADN of the mycorrhizae, DNA, sorry, of the mycorrhizae. And um, the biggest improvement you can find in mycorrhizae is when you, you grow constantly cover crop and mix cover crop. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we found in soil with no cover crops a kind of heart, what we call heart of mycorrhizae that was um, about 320 DNA of different mycorrhizae. And by the time you use cover crop and you use conservation agriculture, even if you use glyphosate, okay, we go up to 650 DNA of mycorrhizae. So, which means uh, the first things, it may harm some of the mycorrhizae, okay? And if you look very picky, someone will find an effect but then the effect of cover crop and no tillage and having plants doing photosynthesis all the time and connecting to the old mycorrhizae is a thousand times more effective in building the mycorrhizae than any kind of, of pesticide or the glyphosate. Okay, it's just, I mean, we have to learn how to look things in a balance. Okay, if we just concentrate with binoculars, we will, uh, you know, dive in a wrong debate once again. Well, that was a wonderful way of rounding up the whole debate, in fact, that we've got to keep a balanced and open mind about this and talk sensibly. But thank you very much, gentlemen, that, uh, on the panel and all of you for your questions. Thank you.